Uh, Dalit, uh, I am thinking that the most of you must have heard what Dalit theology is. Um, but at the same time, I want to give a little um, introduction to what it is. A Dalit is commonly referred to the group of people who are otherwise known as the untouchables. So untouchables, it sounds really horrible to even hear. So untouchables is not a caste per se, but the certain group of people uh, based on who they are and what they work and according to the uh, religious uh, categorizing within, to the, within the broader caste systems. That is what um, they have uh, tried to do. So uh, just to give again a, a quick introduction about what caste system is, there are five major castes and the fifth caste is the one that is really on the lower, um, lower side. And so they are actually not even part of the Brahma, the creator body as they are known, but um, they're the untouchable, they are made from the dust. And there are several different kinds of understandings of who these untouchables are. Although un al they are associated with the lowest card, they are not, Dalit does not necessarily refer to a particular caste, but to the inhuman conditions to which its so-called untouchables have been reduced. So Dalit is a kind of a condition that it reflects. So in some ways, it is a descriptive term for who they are and what kind of conditions they, they are under, rather than it is a caste in itself. And a lot of people do mistake that one. So conditions of Dalits is uh, official degradation by the society and religious uh, understanding itself that they are born into that kind of um, life and that that's where they belong. But that doesn't mean it is a so socio-cultural um, perspective, but uh, constitutionally, they do have equal rights with among um, everyone else. So Dalits continue to uh, uh, have this stigma and shame and a permanent social uh, lower grade untouchable status. Some people still call them untouchables. Some people um, in, in, in a daily life, uh, popular culture. And in India, um, there are, especially in the rural areas, there is a main um, part of the residential area. And uh, with the, after several miles of a bare space uh, for dividing them, and there is a place where only Dalits live. So Dalit, uh, Dalits have been considered ritually impure and they are socially polluting. Um, so, and that kind of status is continuously shared. So how come Dalit uh, has become a theology and why it is important for uh, Christianity in India is uh, during the missionary movements, most of the um, people that got converted into Christianity were from Dalit an untouchable caste. But there was a fewer number of people that also converted into um, Christianity. So those, uh, that, those um, educated and uh, high caste people began to produce theology in, in touch and in connection with uh, um, the missionaries who were bringing uh, the Christianity into India. So that they produced Indian Christian theology. Indian Christian theology um, primarily uh, produced a high a theology from the high, and they also produced the theology in uh, trying to connect with the Hinduism and what uh, it actually has to offer in inter-religious dialogue and such a things. So Dalit uh, identity, of course, uh, again, I said, it's not a caste, but it is an anti-caste subjectivity. So Dalit is a, uh, it is a question whether it is a descriptive term or a perspective. So there is, um, it is a perspective. So not all untouchable uh, uh, belong, and I even hate to use that word, the, the, the constitutional term for that is a scheduled caste. So all scheduled castes do not necessarily have to be Dalit in their perspective. Dalit is an anti-caste subjectivity. So Indian Christian theology was produced by the, the fewer high caste people who got converted into Christianity, uh, but they did not um, look at the theology in India should even address unjust system of caste system. 
they were working the most of the theology that was produced in this Indian Christian theology uh, was uh, to work within the culture rather than the challenge culture. It is the liberationist theology, the liberation theology that gave a real um, grounding and inspiration to Dalit theology. It is, um, Dalit theology is liberationist in its very perspective and it comes from the experience of the people, their suffering and everything. So it brings a spiritual freedom at some, in some ways, but they still uh, face sociological freedom. So within Dalit, among Dalits itself, again, it is not completely liberationist even in Dalit theology because there are so many intersections. So one of the intersections is Dalit feminist intersections. So people still struggle within, within Dalit the, um, uh, theology for not uh, really touching upon the uh, issues of feminism, issues of gender. So there are these connections still um, intersections. So Dalit theology, though liberationist, we still have work to do in that sense. So in Indian Christian scenario, they continue to live with shame and honor. Um, they definitely have a lesser access uh, to the facilities. And a lot of Christians, though they call themselves Christians, do not want to associate themselves with caste system. They still carry the burden of this uh, shame and stigmatized um, uh, identity. So there is always this borders and redlining between uh, high caste people and uh, uh, lower caste people. So Dalit theology is basically, as I mentioned, is liberationist. Uh, and so where does it come from? It comes from Dalit experience. Um, their experience is so unique that it actually brings a perspective and a lens into the theology that they produce. So that is a starting point. So in, in, in one sense, it could also be very autobiographical. So it is even if they, are, they share their stories or not, but it is the stories that actually brings voice, the lens and the perspective. So um, it is very authentic in its sense. So therefore it is liberationist and authentic and it comes from the real experiences. And Dalit intersections are, um, Though they, they, it caste is just one identity, but the intersections that they have, the poverty, the, cla the class issues, and the kind of facilities that they cannot access, and uh, so backward in their um, uh, possibilities to come, even though constitution offers equal opportunity, the equity is not there for them at all. Um, and therefore the liberation from all aspects of its intersection is what the Dalit theology advocates for. Um, so again, well, it is, um, uh, when uh, we speak about Dalit theology, Dalit experience, the tendency is that uh, we think it's all one level, one way, homogenous, but it does call for attention to other identities such as class and gender and the educational uh, experience and how it is all. So Dalit theology uh, challenges any theology or a biblical text or a tradition or interpretation of anything that is not liberating. So liberation is a prime and um, um, liberation from the oppression or any kinds of uh, inequalities is a prime uh, focus of Dalit theology. So again, we are, we, uh, I'm going to skip this one, Dalit theology and hermeneutics, again, uh, feminist hermeneutics and the class uh, uh, hermeneutics. So all of that is, uh, they are in inter intersections and it is important to deconstruct at times and reconstruct and reimagine while going through that process. So it is um, definitely uh, fluid also uh, in the way that it approaches, especially when it is intersecting with other um, aspects. Uh, what is the relevance of Dalit theology in global context is uh, important uh, for us at this time, uh, is also because um, Dalit theology can be viewed as it just belongs to India, but it is also an agency that provides the method and the methodology and offers a lens and perspective. 
And so I wanted to, uh, uh, what is Dalit theology's mission? So I wanted to quickly go through a hermeneutical process of, um, from Luke 10, 25, 37. And the text that I picked is the Good Samaritan text. And so because it, we don't have to really indulge in the text because it's a known story. So the person comes, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So it already shows a person looking up uh, to inherit eternal life. It is not coming from within the experience. It is, again, a very um, transcendental and a looking from above kind of theology. So it is the first question. And so uh, Jesus answers, love, reminds the greatest commandment, to love the Lord with, uh, with all your strength and everything and also love your neighbor yourself. And then the next question is, um, what is, so this is the kind of equation that is given there. So then the question is, who is my neighbor? And then he tells the story of a good Samaritan. Of course, you can read it later. And um, so the Samaritan is the one who was able to recognize the person who is in the ditch, who is suffering. And I always wondered what is the uh, what is the reason why Samaritan was able to empathize and was able to uh, uh, attend. So I think the Samaritan's perspective and theology is so close and similar to Dalit theology, who is able to recognize the suffering, who is able to attend and approach the liberation is essential in this aspect. So um, I, I, I'm Comparing the Samaritan's perspective is because Samaritan himself is in that same position, maybe a wounded healer, a someone who can recognize, someone who has the authenticity to be able to see, look down, and then be able to connect with the neighbor. So in the global context, Samaritan was an agent to bring that liberation to that person. And so the mission uh, text is um, what uh, Jesus says is, go and do likewise. To be a neighbor is to be a Christ-like. As Dalit theology offers that perspective of how we can be neighbors and how can we bring mission and message. Uh, to be a neighbor is to be Christ-like. And what must we do to become such a neighbor in a global context? So um, these are my few thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sureka, uh, for your opening uh, presentation. We now go on to Gladson to offer some engagement and response to your presentation. Thank you, Gladson. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Gione, for this uh, opportunity, first of all. And also, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Nalavala, for this very passionate uh, sharing. I would say it's a very passionate because it, it shares the nuances of Dalit theology and Dalit hermeneutics so passionately. Particularly, particularly for me, that's so important, particularly in the context of mission. You know, um, I'm sure that all of us would agree that, um, that you helped us to understand the need for a Dalit theological and hermeneutical intervention to the way we understand and envision mission, um, you know, in our contemporary context and also for the fu future, you know, as uh, Gioni was mentioning in his introduction. So the mission for the future, how do we envision and understand uh, and radically renewed uh, missional understanding? Um, so to be very brief uh, to your self-passionate and profound uh, presentation, uh, I would like to point out five major highlights which I think are my takeaway, um, you know, uh, from from this uh, uh, sharing this morning, um, and this is also uh, in a way for us to continue to contemplate on the subject, uh, uh, also to widen the idea of uh, uh, mission in the context of Dalit theology. What Dalit theology has. Uh, to contribute, uh, to, uh, to, to expand our understanding of uh, mission and also to unlearn uh, from our uh, way of understanding a mission. Number one, reasserting Dalit agency in Christian mission. Uh, the presentation, your presentation reminded us that Dalit theology for over the decades has provided a perspectival shift 
to the ways how mission is understood. You have told us that Dalit theology challenges us to recognize the centrality of Dalit agency in Christian mission. Dalit theology, as you have rightly reminded and as we learn, it vehemently disturbs the dominant worldviews of mission, which are shaped by colonial and caste hegemonies. Those dominant theologies and mission, as you rightly pointed out, diminish Dalit bodies and experiences as mere objects of mission, Christian mission, to be precise. And they deny the active and resistant agency of Dalits in the mission of liberation. So Dalit theology, as you rightly said, reclaims that, that creative and critical Dalit agency. And this presentation, in my opinion, as I see, is all about reasserting and reclaiming the centrality of Dalit agency in Christian mission. The second uh, highlight or takeaway for me is relocating margins in Christian mission. You also reminded us how Dalit theology helps us to reframe the frameworks of mission, mm -hmm. particularly by reimagining the margins. That's what I found it so powerful. A shift from mission to the margins to mission with the margins and now mission from the margins uh, or of the margins has to be duly credited to Dalit theology. The colonial understanding of margins, you know, margins as potential diaconal and missional spaces is problematized by Dalit theologies. And it sees, a Dalit theology sees margins as potential liberative and salvific spaces. And that is that was so uh, evidential in your rereading of the biblical text. The biblical example that you gave and the interpretation that you engaged with made it very clear that marginal locations and marginal identities are not missional other or missional spaces, rather they are liberative spaces. So thank you for that. And the third one, third one is what I would uh, really uh, appreciate and take home, uh, take away with me is Dalit theologies call for a radically renewed hermeneutics. Now the, the, the relevance of Dalit biblical hermeneutics for the global context that you shared this morning help us to rethink the way the other is constructed, the way the other is interpreted, the way the other is treated. And you, in, in a way, you helped us to understand the other or recognize the politics of othering. And that's what Dalit theology does. And you helped us to understand that. And the fourth one, recognizing Dalit intersections, which I really found so profoundly came out uh, from your presentation. You called us to recognize the intersectionality of caste, class, and gender. And I would add also sexuality. Yes in our mission theologies, in our missional practices. How, I mean, what was so profound, interesting was how Dalit womanist theological and biblical interventions help us to recognize Dalit intersections. That was, uh, you know, uh, was so evident and you gave us an ex immense examples to understand that. And the last takeaway for me, the last highlight, the Dalit, rewriting the choice of biblical text for Christian mission. mission. Here, rewriting, my spelling would be not uh, W-R-I-T, rather rewriting, R-I-G-H-T-I-N-G, rewriting the choice of biblical text for Christian mission. We all know that the historical choice of biblical text to legitimize Christian mission was Great Commission borrowing from William Carey's uh, you know, titling of this passage, Matthew chapter 28, which was 1792. But still we uphold that as the uh, you know, text for understanding Christian mission. But you have taken a subverting kind of a, um, uh, you know, um, way uh, by claiming the great commandment as your text for your her hermeneutical interpretations. And that is, I see, that is a profound way of Dalit subversion of colonial mission theologies. 
there is a paradigm and i could see the paradigm is shifted from colonial legitimization of christian mission to dalit releasing or reeasing the text from colonial and casteist missional burden now i repeat that you you have helped us to see the paradigm shift a shift from colonial legitimization of christian mission to dalit releasing or reeasing the text from colonial and christian missional burden for all these things i want to thank you and also all the dalit theological and hermeneutical interventions and interrogations so far and which are also the ones which are happening now in our context so thank you so much thank you so much